A very good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the, the Chemical Engineering Section Committee of the Institution of Engineers, uh, I would like to welcome you all for today's lecture. Uh, today's lecture is to be delivered by Dr. Deshai Bhutteju, uh, alumni of the University of Murtu. He passed out from the University of Murtu in the field chemical and process engineering in 2003. Then after a short span at the university as an instructor, he proceeded <coughs> to Norway for, for his uh, higher studies. And in 2010, he did his PhD in chemical and process engineering, especially uh, in relation to uh, uh, safety and uh, uh, risk aspects of the industry, right? Now today's lecture is uh, why risk assessments fail a philosophical comprehension of safety risk assessments in high risk industries. Now Dr. Buteju after his graduation has been uh, working in the oil and gas industry as a, uh, a specialist uh, in analyzing uh, risk assessments and uh, you know uh, uh, recommending uh, you know various uh, techniques to minimize risks so recently he has been involved in many uh, significant projects in the oil and gas industry where he has uh, been able to develop methods of uh, uh, you know with, with his uh, uh, special knowledge methods of uh, risk assessments with minimal uh, kind of uh, uh, maximum probability of uh, uh, risk assessment as well as uh, minimization of risks. So in, in this regard, I think he is the ideal person to uh, deliver a lecture in this area. And uh, especially in the context of various accidents that are taking place all over the world, I think risk assessment and uh, analysis and especially at the design stage uh, is very important because at the design stage, if you address all these risk uh, aspects, uh, then you will be able to design a system which will be, uh, you know, free of, I, I mean, very, you know, minimal risk oriented uh, operations. Now recently we know that there was a massive fire at Horana Lindel, uh, Horana, Horana where Unilever had uh, a major fire and the loss was 4 billion, right? So likewise it's this uh, sometimes due to simple mistakes which have not been looked at at the design and operation stages, uh, you know, uh, accidents occur and finally the damages are very, very high. So. Uh, uh, we thank Dr. Boteju for his, uh, uh, you know, taking, taking his time off his vacation uh, to make this lecture. And uh, uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Boteju. I would like to welcome Dr. Boteju for his lecture. Thank you very much. Hello. Good evening and uh, thank you Professor Perra for introducing me. Actually, um, Professor Perra is one of my favorite lecturers when I was studying in Morato University and um, I am greatly honored to be introduced by Professor Perra. So, um, actually even in, uh, I currently work in Norway, uh, even in Norway we observe that uh, it's kind of a problem that uh, people do not move around from academia to industry. So in that respect, I think um, people like Professor Pereira, who has got, got a great um, experience in real industrial uh, task, can be really benefited for the new graduates like uh, the new generation. And that was really an um, important part even during my career when I was studying in Mokri University. So, um, and I welcome everybody here and it's you know, very great to see that uh, good crowd is presented today and uh, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the people, some of you and then I observed that uh, there are very senior personnel who has got uh, decades of experience in the industry and I'm really, really happy to uh, see you and also to address you. In that aspect, uh, Today our discussion, discussion topic is why risk assessments fail and um, I will also talk a little bit about uh, some philosophical background behind this kind of assessments. You can see uh, <coughs> two, two images in the front page and they are showing 
two rock, two rocks to two places. One called Turoi, and the other one called In Aminas. It's a, it's a place name in Aminas. Turoi is a place in Norway. It's a very remote island kind of place in Norway. And In Aminas is a remote place, remote desert place in Algeria. I <coughs> use these two images here because I am going to talk a little bit about two incidents happened in these two places. While discussing those incidents, I will explain why some of the aspects have been missed during this assessment and how can we capture these aspects in future assessment of risk so that we will not repeat some of the tragedies happened in these two places. The content is um, very roughly prepared here. I'm, I, I haven't included all the steps which I'm going to discuss here. It's basically, I will take some uh, case examples. Basically, those two examples I show you early and also a couple of other examples. And then we will discuss some of the lessons we can extract from these examples. Meanwhile, we also discuss some, we will discuss some of the challenges and some philosophical background as I mentioned before. So in the topic we mentioned that uh, we are going to discuss uh, the challenges of risk assessment in high risk industries. What are the high risk industries? We have different type of industries but a high risk industry can be defined as an industry which have a potential to have major accidents. What are the major accidents? Generally, we define a major accident is where a multiple casualties can happen or intensive environmental harm can occur or maybe even some credible health hazard or long duration of time or even maybe some significant property losses and in some occasions reputation damages. If one or more of these things can happen, then we define it. It is as a major accident and then those industries are high risk industries. So our focus here is today basically on high risk industries. That's where basically I'm working uh, as a uh, safety engineer and safety consultant. As I mentioned, these two case, case examples will be uh, quite, will be discussed in quite uh, more details. First one is what I show you earlier called tragedy at Turoi. Maybe you have heard um, earlier this year that uh, in Norway, a helicopter carrying oil and gas workers from an offshore platform returned into the mainland, crashed and 13 people perished, 13 people. Uh, 11 people from six different oil and gas companies and two uh, pilots they perished that is the basis in this uh, case example that's what i mentioned as uh, tragedy at turoi turoi is an island a small a remote island in norway uh, that's where the plane uh, the helicopter crash occurred perhaps you might not have heard about in amina's gas plant attack uh, in algeria I chose that because it's also a joint venture between uh, two other companies and a Norwegian oil, oil company. And that impacted uh, also the safety industry in Norway because five Norwegians died in that incident. Mm. So it was quite an incident that we were familiar with. We will go into details later on. In addition, maybe in some occasions, if time permits, uh, I don't know actually how much time I can go, 45 minutes, something like that. Yeah, should be for sufficient. Yeah, so maybe I will not be able to cover all those things, but I will try to uh, cover as much as possible with good enough details. If I have time, I will also talk a little bit about this uh, deep water horizon blowout and uh, flint water crisis. You should have heard about this flint water crisis in U.S. city of Flint, where thousands of people um, got um, lead poisoning due to uh, poor management of risk. And some examples I will uh, also take, in some examples I will also take um, Fukushima Daiichi Japan incident, if time permits. This incident in Turoi, Norway, that happened early this year in April 29th. 
in uh, north sea oil platforms both in uh, norwegian sector and also in uk sector it's very common or actually that is the primary primary mean of transport of oil and gas workers from mainland to uh, offshore oil platforms by helicopters because that's the most efficient and um, actually safest uh, right now the mean of transport with with the practical concern, concerns if if you, if you include the practical limitations so every day dozens of helicopter flights happen from mainland to uh, offshore platforms and back again during last 10 years or not even even, even more than 10 years norway didn't have any single fatal accident actually during the last 20 years so this was the first fatal accident happened in norway after 20 years at turo so this particular helicopter that was returning uh, returning from uh, this field called gulfax b it's about a uh, few hundred kilometers away in the ocean and uh, the flight time is around 1 hour and it was flying to this, uh, this city called bergen actually it's it's kind of oil capital in norway most of the oil and gas activities are based in bergen so people fly out of bergen and come back to the same city it was only about 15 minutes distance from the main uh, the, the airport in bergen when the helicopter crashed at turoi as i mentioned 13 people died so very sunny and un unusually calm weather condition you cannot blame anything on the weather conditions nothing nothing on weather it was it was a picture perfect weather at that time at around 12 noon what happened was according to the eyewitness even now even even if this was a remote island in norway there were some tourists uh, local tourists who were spending swimming and uh, those activities couple of them were present in this island they saw a helicopter coming suddenly the noise changes what they saw was the rotor main rotor assembly of the helicopter detached from the helicopter and the helicopter suddenly at that moment without anything just crashed because once you lose the lose the main assembly main rotor assembly you can't fly a helicopter because that's a critical safety component and you cannot even double down that it dived around uh, 600 plus meters into um, this rocky island and exploded on impact rescue der arrived uh, quite soon within 25 minutes but but uh, no lives had been saved was possible to save maybe this picture this this is a very quite famous picture this this went all over the world in main media cnn bbc everywhere because this is the rotor assembly that disassembled detached from the helicopter and the assembly landed about few hundred meters away in a small different island this is the place it landed uh, maybe i can try to show you a video here in this particular incident yeah i eventually got it <laughs> at least i mean the time spent is more than the time of the video itself so <laughs> um this is basically uh, the uh, this is the crash scene just after the crash um, you can see the rescuers are approaching and trying to manage whatever remaining there um mm, yeah that is the um, remote island of turoi the response time is quite impressive that in this kind of a remote location the response within 25 minutes 30 minutes it is kind of according to the accepted uh, time of response but in this case unfortunately nothing to be saved this is what uh, it's a more interesting video but i am literally scared to click this uh, <laughs> if the same thing happened yeah but hopefully not mm. at least if i can go to the yes it's much better it's not yeah this is the type of helicopter what he calls super puma and there's a yeah you can see this uh, rotor it's going along it's the rotor disassembled rotor from the helicopter it's just just flying along without the helicopter and landed few hundred meters away from the helicopter and the 
crash has already been happened now right there so um, due to this uh, amateur video the cause was quite clear from the very beginning it was not a mystery and uh, bit easier for the uh, investigation team these are the rescuers arriving at that moment yeah we don't need to see much more than that there yeah before discussing the risk um, perspective this is some uh, data statistical data helicopter accident statistics basically offshore helicopters we are not talking about this all type of helicopters but in this case we are talking about this north sea offshore helicopters the people travel uh, the, the helicopters used for transporting oil and gas workers from and out of the platforms using during 1999 to 98 decade these numbers represent number of fatalities per million person flight hours quite a impressive um, thing that means if you have <coughs> if you multiply like the number of flyers by the number of um, flight time of each helicopter and then take it into the millions then you have number of millions person million person flight hours then we accept that about 1.6 people not about actually 1.6 people have died during 1990 to 1998 with in uk and norway the figure was 2.3 but if you look at this 1999 to 2009 decade uk they have died or they have fatalities of 5.6 people per every million person flight hours in norway that was zero nobody died due to a helicopter crash during that decade so that is quite impressive that is the accident statistics and the table below we have the risk statistics this is the expected risk level or the estimated risk level or the accepted risk level because we have to accept that based on the risk acceptance criteria and the, according to the risk evaluation risk assessment so according to these figures during uh, 1999 to 2009 we should have died uh, we should have one fatality per every million person flight hours but fortunately we didn't have we had zero but in uk sector they had 5.6 and if you combine all those 20 years 90 from 92 from 1992 2009 for those 20 years the accepted risk the estimated risk was that there would be 1.1 person more than one person will die when you have million person flight hours and the actual figure was 0.9 according to the accident data so what, what does these things tell us um, now this is a prediction this was a prediction before thuro accident that's why this is quite interesting to see look at in norway we have a helicopter safety risk assessment for every decade so we had two uh, two safety studies uh, uh, helicopter safety studies before and then we have this third study which is intended to cover the period from 2010 to 2019 and Turoi accident happened with, during this period so we saw that uh, the estimated risk level was reducing reducing every decade starting from risk level of 1.2 fatalities then it became 1 and then for this current decade risk assessors estimated that the risk level would be 0.8 fatalities per million flight hours um, after Turoi we have already exceeded this value so we have because we had 13 fatalities up to this amount of flight hours I cannot uh, exactly tell the number of flight hours we have covered at this moment but the thing is if we maintain 
this uh, level of risk like that then now we have this um, Turo accident 13 people died but if we maintain zero further accident for next 20 years still we will achieve this number estimated point level of uh, level of 0.8 or little more than that maybe 0.9 because uh, in this figure we, uh, you can see the traffic volume in Norway offshore um, uh, traffic helicopter traffic so it's around 0.7 million flight towers every year so every 10 years there will be 7 million flight towers every 20 years there will be 14 million flight towers so if we have 13 people died for 14 million flight towers we will still have about 0.9 fatalities per million flight towers so it is still we are even after two we, we might be close to the accepted assessed risk level but the problem is is this ethical acceptance because I, I cannot go and tell this uh, to the victims the loud ones of loud ones of the, these victims in Turoi that your death is still acceptable <laughs> I can't tell that simply <laughs> so the, that, that is the challenge in this kind of assessment we might be still within the statistical limits but risk is much beyond these statistics that's what I want to emphasize it's much beyond um, statistical limits these numbers in risk assessment, they are not just figures and numbers. They have heartfelt feelings and they have real life consequences on the lives of people, many people. So that, that's, that's the challenge of this kind of risk assessments. At that moment, that's why I want to discuss this concept called risk perception. What is risk perception? Because in risk assessment, we often talk about a lot of numbers, statistics. As I show you that, we, we put different figures, one person, one fatality per every million flight hours or so and so. But risk perception can be very different from these statistical numbers. Statistical risk is assessed by a risk assessor or a statistician or what we call expert experts they, they, they calculate these numbers but when we look at this uh, lay persons common people public what they perceive is also a part of the risk what they really see after two accident what people felt there what the country felt what the, what the world world felt about this offshore um, safety helicopter safety so in this risk perception is somewhat diff different aspect than the statistical risk that we calculate. Risk perception has very little value on the statistics. It doesn't necessarily depend on the statistic because perception is very subjective thing. Subjective means it can depend on the person who you are talking to. And also emotional. Perception can depend on the emotional status of the person at a very particular time. And also risk perception is contextual because risk perception cannot be taken out of its context or the background. It always depends on the background. Uh, if, if, if you talk to a statist stat statistician, he will give maybe the same risk level, statistic risk level for two different incidents at two different environments. But the perceived risk can be very different from that environment to this environment based on the background. That's what we call risk perception so in risk assessment sometimes we fail to capture this aspect risk perception if we fail to capture risk perception maybe that assessment is not not uh, perfect or not ideal or not even suitable that we have to remember again if you go back to this Turo accident uh, in Norway there had been a lot of controversy around this particular helicopter type called Super Puma because there had been a couple of earlier accidents also related to the gearbox assembly of this particular helicopter Super Puma type. But uh, interesting enough, if you look at statistics, nobody can tell that Super Puma helicopter is more dangerous than the other type of helicopters. 
there's no simply no statistical um, significance of those accidents to tell such a thing but people's opinion is very different now people even the offshore people not only offshore people and their family members they will be much more scared if they knew that they are going to fly a super puma instead of a different type of helicopter like Sirkovsky 92 that's also a very popular helicopter in Norwegian offshore so when people are flying they wonder okay can I fly to the Sirkovsky instead of a super puma <laughs> if, okay if the helicopter is super puma all right <laughs> it's just a lot of stories going on those kind of things so that's very related to this concept of risk perception and even we discussed this concept of risk perception even right here in ISL uh, some time back so also we have a paper on this aspect if some of you are interested please um, try to find this paper even if you write to me I can give that this is one uh, study we conducted on this concept of risk perception so I am not going to further on that aspect if you are interested you can read this now we go to a little bit different uh, topic of uh, that related to why risk assessment failed treating statistical limits um, once again if you if I um, this graph is taken from this uh, helicopter safety study number three conducted for Norwegian offshore I extracted from that report which is the valid report for this current period of helicopter transport so every year we estimate that we can reduce this risk level further and further and further but every technology has a certain minimum level that we can achieve as a minimum risk level we might not going we might not be able to go beyond that with that particular technology perhaps now that is a lot of opinion expert opinion a lot of discussion going on in Norway that have we really achieved the minimum risk level related to helicopter safety in Norway what is the road away from Turoi what can we do if you if you look at the helicopter safety um, statistics we, we see that uh, this level of risk like 0 0.8 0 0.91 fatalities per every million flight hours that is kind of absolute limit we can achieve so whatever we do because there there have been a lot of improvement about the maintenance schedules and um, the, the, the rescue and safety training for people and the reliability of these helicopters but it's still even after those things we are still experiencing this kind of uh, tragedies I told you that during last 20 years in Norway we had zero fatalities but then that happens now then happened 13 people perished and 20 years back also we had accident and 12 people perished so with this technological limit we are moving around this fatality rate close to one fatality per every million flight hours even after a lot of attempts so what can we do if we are really reaching the statistical limit of this um, particular technology or the, in this case it is helicopter if that is the case then we cannot do anything anymore with this particular technology without changing the technology itself so that's one challenge in risk assessment because we maintain certain technology and we are asked risk assessors to assess the risk and recommend actions to improve but there is a certain limit after that we cannot have we cannot improve more than that without changing the technology itself for example in this case if you consider helicopter main rotor and gearbox in this case we we saw that the gearbox failed the main rotor assembly failed and it crashed that is the causative in reliability aspects in a helicopter technology we cannot have <coughs> we cannot double down even because under normal helicopter practical uh, technology we cannot have two rotors in uh, this kind of technology uh, helicopter it's only one gearbox one rotor if it fails it is a safety critical failure and also the rotor is the most loaded component the most hard work component it can fail so what can we do so if we are to reduce the risk further then we have to change the 
technology itself. So in this case, I have in the, in, included one figure here. This is called what we called um, teal totters. This is a different type of, uh, it is not a real helicopter, it is a different type of uh, aircraft. Now, in Norway, people are talking about, can we introduce these teal totters instead of helicopters? Because in this tail rotor, you can see there are two rotors and this rotor can be tilted from a vertical position to horizontal position. So what happened was, what happened is during takeoff, this will be in this position and act like a helicopter, it uh, lift, then gradually it will, the, the, the rotors will be tilted to a like a propeller like position, horizontal. Then it become a propeller aircraft and then it fly and then it has to land, it will again slowly raise the rotors and become a helicopter. This is the technology called tail rotors. So this is something under discussion in Norway. If we are, if, because statistically we have this one fatality per every million hours, but now according to the current social context, we cannot even accept that risk any further. Maybe that was accepted few decades ago as acceptable risk, but now the social culture ethics has been changed people talking, we cannot simply any longer accept this risk, one fatality per every million hours. It's even it's not enough, not good enough. So then we have to change the technology. So that's something I, I need to emphasize. So, sometimes we achieve limits of technology and risk remain at the lowest level. If we are to reduce risk, we have to change the technology. Yeah, now we will go to another topic related to this uh, causatives that is that are leading to um, risk assessment failures. One thing called safety culture, that is also very important aspect. Once again, if I include this uh, helicopter accident data, UK versus Norway, 99, from 99 to 2009, we saw that there is a huge difference between the statistics in Norwegian sector and the United Kingdom sector of the offshore because this North Sea offshore platforms they are divided between UK and Norway. So the operation systems are almost identical. That is why this study because after this statistical significant statistical difference UK appointed a special commission to investigate why we have this high this much of risk this much of fatalities when Norway has zero accidents. That commission house of that was called house of commons I think part of their parliament transport committee. Their study says civil aviation authority CAA review was unable to identify any material differences in operations, maintenance practice or regulations that could account for this difference. That was their conclusion. So they did not see any difference in the maintenance practice between Norway and UK and also the um, other aspects like operational number of flight hours, the material, the training of the pilots that was identical. But we had this difference. Sometimes we can see that even if all the other conditions are same, safety culture can impact how the safety is being manipulated or safety is being um, result oriented. Especially in Scandinavia, Norway and uh, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Finland, etc., uh, the, the Denmark, not the, not the Finland, it's a Nordic country, but not Scandinavia. Safety culture is given quite good attention, and um, it's, it's, it's common opinion that uh, safety culture in uh, Scandinavia is quite impressive and one of the best in the world. So, what is really safety culture? There can be different opinions. Um, I, I would like I, I like this um, definition that we wrote uh, in one paper in 2015. I would define a safety culture as something a set of commonly accepted norms within an organization that dictates the perceptions, attitudes, values, and behaviors toward the safety of humans, environment, and etc. So, it, safety culture is a, a particular safety culture is parti uh, very specific to an organization, a company, or a school, or it could be any organization. Every organization has some safety culture. 
it, it, it can be a positive safety culture, very positive one, or it can be a negative safety culture, a very negative one. In this definition, norms, I would say, I would define norms as the accepted means of doing things around. In this company, we do things like this, not like this, then this is our norm. Perception is the way of understanding in a company, if I talk to a worker and tell something, there's a certain way that he perceived, he understood, because that, that, that's inherently related to the company culture. If you tell the same thing in a different company, people might understand something different. So that, that's related to the safety culture. Attitudes. Attitude is something like that, um, maybe we can define it as a first impression, that uh, if somebody talking to us or some incident is facing us, then he has few opinions come into our mind at the very first moment. That is the first nature of responding to an event or a person or a similar thing. And values. A values is a, every, every company, every organization has a set of values. Values are the, some concepts that you regarded as precious. So these, these things define your safety culture. If you go a little bit further, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't really like to go very deep into safety culture because this is a different opinion, different topic than risk assessment, but I thought this is quite important to show these uh, few things right here. As I said to you earlier, safety cultures could be positive, very positive safety cultures or negative safety cultures. Negative safety cultures are bad and if you can maintain or if you can develop a positive safety culture, that is the thing we have to do to have a good safety record. So, for example, in a positive safety culture, people always think about we should go beyond the compliance because compliance is the minimum level of safety or sometimes it might not even give the sufficient safety. So, in the positive safety culture, people always think about yeah, we have achieved the compliance but we should go beyond compliance and they seek more important, more improvements beyond the compliance. On the other hand, in a negative safety culture, they think compliance as a burden and they think, okay, we just have to comply, be in compliance. If we, if we are in compliance, okay, that's all. Then we don't have to do anything further. We just start our production or anything or just go do business as normal. The compliance is their standard and sometimes even they even complain about compliance. They might say, okay, these are unnecessary regulations put by government or a regulatory authority. These are unnecessary. These, these just make things work, more hard to work, some kind of things. They might complain. So that's the negative safety culture. And in a positive safety culture, accident only happen very rarely. And even when they happen rarely, they are rigorously investigated. And they find out, they go to the root causes of accident and they accident, they, they will be investigated to the maximum possible extent. And in a negative safety culture, accidents are quite common and they might not even do a proper investigation and they might try to blame it somebody or something and forget it and go beyond with their operation. And in a positive safety culture, learning, the continuous learning is always encouraged. So learning is a part and parcel of the safety culture. On the other hand, in a negative safety culture, they will tell, okay, we have very experienced people. We don't need any further training. We don't, why, why should we need training? When we have experienced people, they have experience of 20, 30 years experience. We are picture perfect. That's it. That's the negative safety culture. And if you go a little further, in a positive safety culture, they are always in alert. They believe that there is always a chance of a major accident. They never think that, okay, we have a positive safety culture, we have everything in compliance and we, we have covered everything and we will not have a, we will never have a major accident. No, they always think there is always a risk of a major accident. So we, we have to expect that and we have to act upon that and we have to be prepared on that. And in negative safety culture, they think, okay, accident never happened here. Last 20, 30 years, we never had any accident. So we are accident-free company. We are accident-free environment. We, 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 why, why, why are you even talking about safety? We never had any accident. 
So we don't have to do anything. We are we are okay. That's the negative safety culture attitude. And in a positive safety culture, the, it's very important that top leadership is actively participating in the safety studies and safety um, uh, training, etc. And you have the fullest support of the uh, fullest support of the top leadership for building safety culture. And in a negative safety culture, the top leadership always encourage production and production and production. And secondary, uh, the safety is given a secondary secondary treatment. And they also believe that maybe too much attention on safety will dampen our production capacity and the production capability and the efficiency of the workers. That's that's the negative safety culture. Yeah, and as I said before, in a positive safety culture, safety is a part and parcel of the organization. It's, it's you, they, they will not distinguish between the normal operation of the institution, normal operation of the company, the production and the safety. They must be integrated together and it's a one single integrated unit. Safety is embedded in every action the company takes. And in the negative safety culture, they always tell that safety is expensive. And we, we, it, will, it will reduce the profitability. And last thing, I just want to show that. In a positive safety culture, what went wrong is the important thing. Then who did it wrong? In all, the, all the investigations are based on this concept. After a, even a minor accident, you put you 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 conduct investigations. But the focus of investigation is to find out what went wrong, not the who did the wrong. But on the other hand, in a negative safety culture, it's a blame culture. They try to blame, put the blame on a person, not the culture or the not the the company or the not the not the working style or the not not the safety systems. Because if, we, if, we, if they blame put on them, then it's, it can be expensive for them to change. But if they put the blame on a single person, that's very easy to forget. This, this person's wrong, wrong doing, this person's fault. So you are responsible for that, not the company, not the culture. That's the negative safety culture. Yeah, so I just wanted to discuss this thing on safety culture because it's very important. And even after lots of risk assessments, sometimes if you do a the same kind of risk assessment for a one company and another company, maybe the outcome will not be this will not be the same because the safety culture is different. Safety culture Im impact the outcomes of safety, uh, the risk assessment. So uh, once again, if you are interested in further, we have also a paper written on this uh, concept of safety culture. You can find it out, and if you want, you can write to me, and I will send you the paper. Yeah. Now we again change the, the topic a little bit, the title. Um, another challenge faced by risk assessors, which could lead to failure risk failed risk assessment, is that trying to draw conclusions from a limited set of data. That is that is a big challenge because <clears throat> when we have a project, we ask risk assessors or statistician to do this job for us. We provide this set of data and assess the risk and give us the value so that we can compare against our risk acceptance criteria. But you, you don't always find the sufficient data to uh, conduct a good job. Sometimes you only have a very limited set of data. Even in this um, helicopter safety studies, we only have a data for a couple of decades because this offshore industry is not that tall. It is started from 19, early 1980s uh, or the last uh, or years of the 70s decade. So we don't have even sufficient data. So we are trying, or we, the risk assessors are struggling to get the maximum out of this limited set of data. So it might not tell you the full picture. That is something we need to remember that we are trying to conclude certain things. I told you that there is not sufficient data to tell that this Super Puma helicopter which crashed in Turoi is less safer than any other type. But definitely people perceive a different picture. Yeah. Before going into my next example, maybe the last example, depending on the type, I just like to talk a little bit about um, this concepts of risk, uncertainty and knowledge. 
because in the in the in the topic i mentioned that maybe we will try to figure out little bit on the philosophical basis of these risk studies so that's why i want to talk even very briefly on this aspect we know that uh, sometimes or in many occasions if you look at some hazardous events the consequences are clear there is no ambiguity on the consequences but the main problem is their probability how likely is this event to occur that is the challenge faced by this uh, risk assessors so the risk understanding completely depend on our knowledge of the likelihood of this event or our knowledge about this event if you have increased knowledge then it decreases the uncertainty and enhances the risk understanding that's a very basic thing on on that light there are different events which we can categorize different events which you find in risk assessments can be categorized into this sort of uh, criteria there are certain events that uh, what we can tell as non norms during risk assessment we know that there is a potential risk and then we we we, we find out little bit further and we can document it and we can assess that risk and sometimes maybe you know that there is a problem there is a risk but you didn't you don't simply care you just uh, maybe due to negligence you just forget it and that risk remains maybe without uh, documenting and sometimes you know that there is a risk there is a event but you you can you can only do only very limited things due to different restrictions maybe financial restrictions because everything is limited by a certain amount of budget for every risk assessment have a certain budget so during risk assessment you know that there is a un undiscovered area there is a unknown risk but you just have to submit your risk assessment at this stage within this budget frame so you don't have enough time or suitable persons to investigate that so sometimes even when you have full knowledge or certain amount of knowledge that will not your risk assessment will still not capture that risk due to other restrictions and also some there could be known unknowns you know that something is missing in the early case you know there is a problem that's not missing that you clearly know that but you cannot act upon it but in certain occasions you feel the research is a feel that there is a certain event you don't clearly know and you you, you don't have the complete picture on that particular area but unfortunately you don't have capacity once again due to financial restrictions or the time restrictions or the skill restrictions you can't simply investigate them and capture that total risk on that unknown territory that i would call non unknowns but these last two things they are the most dangerous things that could lead to failure of risk assessment quite often as we have seen in the industrial case examples unknown knowns in risk assessment there are always some unknown territories aspects that you don't know the risk assessor doesn't know that area but the question is there may be some other people or other institution other organization who have an who has an idea on that particular area that's what i would call unknown knowns you that you don't know that but there could be people who know that similarly unknown unknowns is that we expect that nobody has an idea on that particular risk but at that particular time but personally i also i believe that in many locations these unknown unknowns can also be uh, converted to the unknown knowns the previous one in many locations even if you don't you don't know that some persons might know this thing further clearly that i will come back to this concept in my next example 
and how these why these things are important to notice during risk assessments so as a conclusion here what i want to tell you is that risk assessments are subjective it risk assessment are subjective to the knowledge of the people who are conducting this risk assessment it's, it's not an absolute entity it is subjective to the person who is conducting the risk assessment so that is one major thing that um, risk managers has to know because when 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 we have a project what we do is we we, we first go through the company uh, requirement list and then we see okay we have to conduct a risk assessment for this particular project and the um, these are these 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 are the things topics included in this risk assessment may be fire risk explosion risk work in work in work environment risk or outside environment with pollution risk those kind of things depending on the project we decide that and then we we call a third party sometimes or the different experts who has thorough knowledge on each of this area and ask them to conduct a risk assessment so then they for example we might ask a cfd specialist to conduct a fire risk analysis simulation fire simulation and conduct a risk assessment and tell us the particular risk level of this platform then we take that number and try to compare it against our risk assessment criteria and if it is within the risk assessment criteria we just say okay risk assessment is fine we don't have a um, exceeding risk and we don't have a problem with this project then we go ahead but that is not a very good um, approach the risk managers the people who are managing this risk the safety managers they have to put more attention on this risk assessment studies that they have to do if you if you receive a risk assessment report it's not just simply enough to compare just to read the the, the conclusion section or the or the you know, the summary section and conclude that okay we have a good summary risk assessment report and it is within the uh, risk acceptance criteria and everything is set ready for project go ahead that is not a good thing risk managers or the safety managers they have to go through this report and they, they they don't have necessary to be experts on each particular area if you are if you access in a risk assessment report you you can't simply be expert on every area that's a, that's a simple as that you can't be a expert on fire risk and you can't be a expert simultaneously on a working environment and environmental care that is not simply possible but still if you if you use due diligence and common sense and go through these studies you can notice certain problems you can notice problems with the hypothesis that's very important assumptions in, in risk assessment every risk assessment is based on a set of assumptions so the verification of these assumptions is extremely important you can't just list the assumptions and accept them as they are you just have to go through the assumption and think further how valid this this how valid this assumption is and can this assumption fail maybe not today maybe after 5 years can this assumption fail those are the things that risk managers or the risk assess, uh, safety engineers has to think further is something just going beyond the risk assessment reports yeah what's the time how much time we have <laughs> 15 minutes 20 minutes 15 or oh, are, are we already out of the time <laughs> yeah okay yeah then i go through this um, interesting uh, example in aminas it's it's a place name don't um, this is not a proposition kind of thing in in aminas is a place name in algeria and uh, in this picture you see that it's the, it's a it's a gas plant in the um, uh, desert and it's also a very huge gas plant and uh, it's a joint venture between a norwegian oil company and british petroleum and this company called sonatrack that is the algerian national oil, oil company they uh, they collectively uh, operate this project uh, the, the plant what happened was in 2013 that, that captured international attention that was a international event actually maybe some of you remember this event it was continuously covered by international media a terrorist attack happened january 2013 a group of terrorist some uh, religious extremist k 
came from uh, partly came from Algeria, partly came from Lib Libya, and pa partly came from uh, Mali state. This African state, no, uh, northern African states. They have done this industrial oil and gas uh, gas facility, and they captured basically foreigners because they were not caring about Algerians. They just left alone primarily, and they they. they took um, hostage of foreign workers because there had been a lot of foreigners because this is a joint venture. There were Norwegians, uh, British people, Americans, a lot of foreigners, a lot of Europeans. So they took hostage of these foreigners and eventually 39 foreigners were killed, including five Norwegians. So that also was a huge uh, media attention in Norway and also internationally. So what went, what went wrong here? Yeah, few more details. It's a large gas field around 2,750 square kilometers. It's even larger than this European, small European state of Luxembourg. It's a small country in Europe. This gas field alone is bigger than that country. And they had 800 workers. It's a huge plant. They had 800 workers when the attack happened. And it was producing from 2006. This joint venture operate since 2006. So you can see this, uh, this is the map. This is the place of Inamina's location and it's very close to the Libyan border. And we have the Mali, the North African state, one of the African states, one of the African states here. So what happened was uh, in this early morning, about uh, yeah, six o'clock around, there was a bus carrying foreigners because they were going to the airport for flying out of the country and some of the foreigners going to the passport offices to renew their document, passports, etc., immigration docu documents. And that bus came out of the plant, gas plant, so very close to the plant, the bus was attacked by terrorists. Even the bus was, bus was escorted by uh, Algerian military vehicles. Still it was attacked by uh, these terrorists and then the bus had to stop and the Algerian military tried to respond to these terrorists but they were overwhelmed by terrorists and simultaneously other group of terrorists attacked the plant and within 15 minutes they captured the plant. So that all happens. So in this plant uh, it's a big facility, the production area and the living quarters, the, they are separate areas. So they, the, the both places, the production area and the living quarters were simultaneously attacked and captured by these terrorists. So by the way, this is this this incident is related to the security risk assessment. So it might be a little bit different from process risk, but still I wanted to take this example because we can we can focus on a couple of different issue, challenges, issues here. So that this will not be, those aspects will not be limited to the risk, uh, security risk assessment, but also to the other risk assessment like process risk. So yeah, in actually, what, what is the main difference between this security risk and the uh, industrial risk? Because in industrial risk, we have hazards. In security risk, we have threats. So that's the difference. So threats are the hazards. And on, on the other hand, in process risk or the industrial risk, the, as an organization here, we have most of the control because we can control the hazards. But in security risk, it comes mostly from the outside. So we have very limited control. It's the, basically the other authorities like government, military, they have to have the control from that side. So that's one difference between the industrial risk and security risk. But as you can see here, these things are also part of our work, the industrial risk assessors, because security is also a safety risk. So it's just a part of the safety risk. You have to, you have to think about that when you are managing the safety. Yeah, interesting enough, during the bus attack, one, one military person was able to alert the guard room in the plant, the guard room, uh, the operator, the plant, guard room operator, he just pushed the security alarm uh, and that alarm sounded throughout the plant. Due to that alarm, many people were able to hide in different areas, like because it's a huge facility, there are a lot of production areas, so many people were able to hide behind the industrial facilities. So that saved a lot of lives because if not for that, they could have captured many more people, many more foreigners and killed them during the attack. So that's, a, that's one interesting thing. So you, the person who, had, who, who um, alert was also being killed later on. So it's a very tra huge tragedy. That, that is a, that's a hero actually. That person 
even he died he was able to save many lives by alerting uh, the guard room so then this attack the total attack went for about basically 3 days and into the fourth day so the first day the attack happened no response the, the algerian military came and surround the area that's all on the first day so this during the second day algerian military attacked this strike this living area and tried to capture or the kill the perpetrators the terrorists then what happened was terrorists collected all the foreigners refugees the, 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 the people they captured and pushed them into vehicle vehicle parade and tried to leave the facility then what happened was algerian military attacked that vehicle convoy and many foreigners died, died due to that attack because uh, that's that's a, some things we may not expect because in this in this joint venture the people the companies expected that algerian military was fully capable of protecting this facility they will save our lives but ironical enough that many foreigners died due to the action of algerian military because when they attacked the convoy the the refugees were there then they died the uh, hostages and also third day it went into third day uh, the group of foreigners they tried to escape into the high desert and it was very dangerous also they spent 15 hours in the high desert before they have been found and uh, rescued and third day <coughs> algerian military again attacked the production facility and once again many um, hostages were also died on that many hostages were also died during that attack and it was only on the fourth day that the basically all terrorists were killed due to the attack along with many uh, hostages and the attack was finished so what happened here we had a very good uh, security risk assessment when uh, the, the when this uh, joint venture went ahead there was a very good security risk assessment and that was update in security risk assessment every year the security risk assessment has been updated but where did the failure happen credit here earlier happens so basically we can see that we can see we can recognize a lack of scenario analysis because uh, <coughs> security risk assessment in this particular case they recognize a terrorist th threat as a major hazard it was they have clearly um, indicated recorded that there could be a high risk of terrorist attack but the problem was that generic risk was not broken down into different scenarios for example the only the threat was mentioned as um, generic uh, terrorist threat but it did not analyze further how from where can this uh, threat happens from which direction can this attack happen if attack happen how the what will be the response those things were not analyzed so then there was no response real response when this actual attack happened so this was a surprise attack and um, initial assumption was that algerian military was able to protect that failed so then there, from that point onwards there was no safety action documented which could have been followed so that's where this security assessment risk assessment failed assumption failure that's the one key aspect in uh, every risk assessment every risk assessment i i briefly mentioned before that assumption all every risk assessment is based on a set of assumptions sometimes if you take a um, total risk assessment for a um, medium scale project like of offshore oil and gas there could be hundreds of assumptions usually they they they, they um, tabulate these assumptions so there could be hundreds of assumptions any of this could fail unless you really put attention on those things so assumption in this case in this uh, in amina's attack assumption failure is the key aspect that's the key failure in this incident because the one of the main assumption was that algerian military should be able to protect against a terrorist threat that failed so what we can do in this kind of situations how can we go forward because every risk assessment is based on assumptions and assumptions can fail maybe not immediately maybe later on so then what we can what can we do so one 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 method is to conduct an assumption failure risk assessment that is one uh, one concept that in modern day safety engineering trying to achieve 
we have risk assessment then we will have a second risk assessment it is assumption failure risk assessment so of course of course when you have a risk assessment you first investigate your assumptions and verify that they are true that is that is a part of the traditional risk assessment you always have to do that you you verify each and every assumption but the second stage we have to think about what if what if these assumptions failed then we have a second risk assessment assessment assumption failure risk assessment sometimes we can capture more 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 of this risk on that stage so when then we can be prepared against a assumption failure so in this case if we assume if we conducted i don't think we ever had assumption failure risk assessment in this case if we had we could have assumed that okay what happen if the our first assumption of algerian military capable being capable of protecting us failed then what is our next option maybe we could have had private armed guard within the plant so that they could delay such a attack until until reinforcement arrived from outside military so that could have been done and lack of dynamic risk assessment i also briefly mentioned that sometimes many assumptions are valid true at this particular moment but you don't have any guarantee that they will keep keep uh, true in the five years time so maybe in this case algerian military was capable at very moment in 2006 when we when we started this joint venture because at that time the country algeria was a stable quite stable and the nearby country libya was quite stable and the mali was stable but then what happened the arab spring happened libya become a failed state the the lot of terrorist group initiated and the weapons circulation increased so these things were not captured at the that very early risk assessment so that's why we need a dynamic risk assessment so even though in this case the, the risk assessment was updated every annually it was not 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 up to a very good dynamic risk assessment because they they failed to capture this the the situation development in the region yeah so that's one important aspect to consider do do we really need a dynamic risk assessment if our conditions are changing we have to think about that and sometimes when a risk is shared by a couple of stakeholders in this case the the gas plant was operated by three different companies so <clears throat> norwegian company norwegian partner basically believed that other two partners because one is from local area one local partner and the other vendor other partner british petroleum it has it's a international entity with lot of experience so we expected that basically in security reasons it is fully under control our partners can fully manage this risk and that failed so that that something can happen during risk assessment if you are shared risk people think okay we don't have to think of worry about that they 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 have managed that they that is under control and sometimes that doesn't happen so in always it's always very important that we have our independent assessment of risk sometimes not relying on others too much and yeah as i said i'm taking this as a case example but this most of these things are very common for all risk assessment time there is a you see that when we are updating a risk assessment from one to uh, maybe annual risk assessment update or something sometimes we recognize new actions okay the, now the risk has changed risk level has increased so we need increase safety barriers and new risk assessment or the updated risk assessment will will definitely list the action actions to be taken to um, maintain this risk level without increasing but the problem is always there is a time delay between this recommendations and actual implementation if that happened at all for example in 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 amina's case in 2009 risk assessment they observed that in the region now we have a high amount of suicide bombers targeting these facilities so what we we, we need to reinforce our plant gas plant so they recommended couple of actions maybe some concrete barriers Uh, and some uh, security alarm systems uh, video the camera systems those things and uh, some barriers but unfortunately many of these actions have not been done until this attack happened 
because we, we cannot simply blame them but but the thing is that that is the inherent time delay between these kind of things you recommend that but there could be um, the, the funding restrictions there could be logistic things because in this case it is a very remote facility in the out, out in the desert so you, fine okay yeah okay we will uh, try to cross down so that we need to uh, understand uh, this time delay so that these time delays could cause failures yeah <coughs> this is also one major challenge faced by risk assessors and the safety safety uh, engineers and safety professionals we are trying to protect plants or facilities sometimes from very rare events very rare events statistically rare but high consequence rare high consequence events they, that they are very challenging because when we are trying to protect against these things financial aspects always challenging because we we only have statistical evidence and we only have a very rare event with less probability and we are in we are proposing some safety barriers but then financial de de departments come and tell us okay you are trying to protect to a very remote possibility and uh, you you don't even think that this safety barrier this new safety barrier will ever need to be worked maybe it will ever it will, it will be there for 20 30 40 years without ever needing it and you are telling us to invest huge amount of money for this white elephant so that that that, that is that is kind of challenge actually we, sometimes it's very difficult to justify this kind of big investment for a very rare event but the thing is if that rare event happened then the loss could be unimaginable so that that spending might be justifiable but it's very very difficult to very difficult to achieve under restrictive budget conditions so that that's one challenge okay i will maybe due to time restriction i will lose uh, i will uh, miss some of these things yeah as i said uh, this rare high consequence events arising from these things like unknown knowns and unknown unknowns because if we if we know that if you have any clue that you will not allow these things to happen and in many of these rare events we don't have a previous example to follow like even in in aminas we never had such kind of huge attack on any oil and gas facility before in the history so this is kind of first thing so that that's why they are challenging so that's why it is also challenging to justify huge investment against new safety barriers or in this kind of events but there are certain things we can use to face this high high consequence events one thing is imagination during risk assessment sometimes you have to be quite bit imaginative if you have if you can imagine little bit sometimes you can discover sometimes you can read telltale signs of a small events that could lead to a bigger events so imagination is a good good character of a say, uh, risk assessor in many occasions yeah yeah i think um, <clears throat> i'm going to finish because there are a few couple of many other things that we need to discuss but depending on the time restriction i will miss those things um Now, deep water horizon also we can talk a little bit, uh, but we don't have enough time. As I mentioned, that in a good, positive safety culture, compliance is not enough. You always need diligence, because, for example, this uh, this is uh, this is a quotation I I I took from this National Commission's report to the U.S. President on deep water horizon uh, blowout. the immediate causes of the macando well blowout can be traced to a series of identifiable mistakes that reveal such systematic failures in risk management that was the conclusion from national commission's report to the united states president on this deep water horizon i didn't have time to discuss uh, the incident but i'm just show showing you yeah sometimes there could this this may be the last thing i am showing you certain risk Rising from frontier technologies are difficult to be captured 
because you 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 do risk assessment over and over for so long, and you you have a you you be, you, you develop kind of habitual risk assessment procedures patterns. But the thing is, technology is slowly evolve. For example, in oil and gas exploration, at the very beginning, we only had land-based oil and gas. So then we had risk assessment. Then we slowly move into uh, shallow waters, and then you still follow the same kind of risk assessment. Then we move a little bit into further out in the water. Then you follow the same pattern of risk. But eventually, we move into very deep water, ultra deep water in the ocean. And that deep water horizon well was a one one kind of thing uh, that I didn't have to discuss. But the, in that case, we were we were using very frontier technologies out in the ocean under difficult environmental conditions and very latest technology. And the complexity was very high compared to those early generation traditional drilling methods, drilling technologies. But still, in risk assessment, we were following the same same kind of aspects and same kind of procedure. But what what we saw here in the deep water horizon blowout was that that traditional risk assessment was not good enough any longer to capture these frontier technologies because technologies are very complicated and the human demand on human aspects are very different and increase pressure and temperature hazard conditions. So those things we need to capture um, in new generation of risk assessments. For example, once again, I am finishing this. The National Commission to the report of the US President also say Deep water energy exploration and production, particularly at the frontiers of experience areas, involve risk for which neither industry nor government has been adequately prepared. So they concluded that at this technology level, we were not prepared. We were simply not prepared. So, the, so it doesn't matter you have a risk assessment. It's not simply good enough to face this new technology complexity. So that we need to think about. Yeah, last thing. Real last thing, okay? <laughs> Don't be fooled by long duration of no accidents. I didn't. Uh, I I thought of talking about this um, um, Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, but now we don't have time. But I'm just mentioning here. Fukushima plant. It was operating since 1971. They operated 40 years without any accident. And in 2011, exactly after 40 years, they had a major accident. Because during those 40 years they didn't have a significant earthquake to generate this kind of tsunami. So they had a sea wall, it was a sea wall. To, to, they, they have, think about the tsunami, but that was only 5.6 5 meter or something, sea wall. So the real tsunami happened in 2000, it was 14 meter. So all the water came and knocked down the cooling water pumps and the nuclear reactor melted down. So because they didn't make, did, having no accident for 40 years, didn't make them any safer. So this is one, one thing, we can hear in many places, people say, okay, we never had any accident in this plant. We are, we are enjoying very good safety, but that's not the case. You might be just good, lucky enough, not safe enough. <laughs> so, so you might have an accident tomorrow. It, it, it's, it's not an excuse. Yeah, I'm not going Fukushima here. Yeah, as I said, forgetting past event because <clears throat> this, this earthquake in Fukushima, that was around uh, nine, magnitude level and they never prepared any earthquake more than seven but the thing is in Japanese history they had two earthquakes or two three earthquakes that happened in this region more than seven one, the last one was in 1930s so that was long ago in the past so they never care about this past event so that's why they face this consequence so you never forget fast so conclusion so those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it very very famous saying George Santana so thank you very much for your time and uh, listening to me so that's my i don't i don't know if you have a time for questions but if you have you can take one the
not a successful like what we are doing. Because second uh, we know the time that they could have any pay. But just from your first day, the man of the helicopter, there is no way that a rotor should fail. Right? So I don't think that type of failure you can relate to any successful figure. Because they should have a procedure where the rotor will not fail. Like for example, if you have a mining industry, no way is to go on there. So somewhere is to fall down the shaft. So something like that. Now, one of the things that struck me when you mentioned that failure, I've never heard of that before, is that you say, let's talk about failure. But when you say a gear failure, that is a very bad thing to grab on. Because you can be geared in such a way, you say that you stay in your gears in your feet. That is one thing. The second thing is, why is it in operation? Presumably, the thing is running in oil, the gearbox. So if they were doing oil analysis, they would have to do that. The other thing is vibration analysis. They would like to extend it. So this guy could extend it. Hopefully, that's the time we are going to do it. But hopefully they are getting vibration and shape. So somewhere along the way, somebody is very business. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Thank you for that comment. Actually, yeah, I really agree. value your um, yeah, understanding of this mechanical aspect on this helicopter failure. The thing is, they, these people it, in, in the accident investigation report, it is very clear that they have followed to the letter all the maintenance procedures, prevent or they, they have a maintenance schedule and also operation schedule. They have maintained that. So they, there is no clear indication that any problem from the workers of this maintenance happened in India. Because actually, I, I just mentioned that people were scared about Super Puma, um, Super Puma helicopters. Kind of similar, accident happened also previous, not in Norway, but I think in UK sector, Super Puma, Super Puma helicopter failed in the same manner. Main doctor failed. So maybe in this case, this is not a maintenance problem, but maybe could be a, even a design problem of this particular helicopter. Yeah. Can I come in there? It's okay, you can, you can just tell. Uh, hmm? I, I it, uh, to say, it's inconceivable hmm. that such a critical component yes, as yes. a rotor of a hmm. helicopter hmm. can just come off. Yeah, yeah. If the shaft fails, yeah, but this complete thing came off. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. This is this has happened more than two times, at least at least two times this happened now. Okay. Yeah. So then, definitely, some people are talking about a design, even a design, design problem of this particular helicopter type Super Puma. Yeah. Can, can go any yeah. yeah. So this has happened to more than two times. It is physically possible. Now we observe that happen. So then the challenge is why this is happening and uh, what is the design problem? Mm. Mm. Our mechanical devices are coming to place. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but the, the thing is i mentioned here right that this this is a safety critical component if it fails very little you can do there is no secondary or the fail safe device to rescue the situation yeah because in this helicopter technology it's some one main rotor so that's why i was talking about this uh, tilt rotor type then you have a two and more more reliability on that so main thing i want to explain here that there are certain technological limits on risk assessments so you you can't go beyond that technology uh, technological limit if you have to ha achieve more risk, more more safety you change the technology hmm. Many of you are interested on this uh, Super Puma incident. I remember that uh, 
a similar, quite similar accident happened in the UK sector, the main rota failure. Then actually Super Puma is manufactured by Boeing Industries. So they even changed the, some aspect, some design of the gearbox. Then we had this experience um, in Turo. So I don't, I don't, I don't simply believe that the Boeing was any less competent on this aspect. They did whatever they can do to fix this uh, helicopter safer. But still, we had this failure. That's why I try to emphasize with technology. Sometimes we reach lower the maximum the lower risk levels. Then we need to think or look other ways to make the things better and safer. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bhateju. Uh, as the chairman of the uh, Chemical Engineering Section Committee, uh, I uh, thank you, Mr. Dr. Bhateju, uh, who uh, dedicated his uh, liberal time in his short vacation in Sri Lanka uh, to give the uh, knowledge to our public. Uh, and uh, IESL has arranged uh, a small token of appreciation to Dr. Bhateju and I uh, invite uh, Mr. P. S. N. Uh, senior member of uh, Chemical Engineering Section Committee to present the token of appreciation to Dr. Bhateju. Also, on behalf of the uh, Chemical Engineering Sectional Committee and ISL, I thank you all the participants uh, who participate for this event and uh, we will organize such events in future also and we welcome all of you to future events too. Thank you very much. <laughs>